Well, like Kate, obviously, I was um, I was thinking about um, your title, 10 years since um, the Iraq war, and I thought about all those things that she talked about, about the mobilization. We thought that the UN would work because the French were so opposed to everything the Americans and the British wanted to do. We knew there were no weapons of mass destruction, and we had the wonderful hand split, and we, I think we were really confident which now seems weird, looking back on it, that we were going to stop the war. And thinking about this evening, I then look back further to the 1960s, when I was in America, um, and there was this massive mobilization against the Vietnam War. And again, it was massive demonstrations, and you had all these incredible intellectuals like Chomsky and Dr. Spock and the Berrigans and Howard Zinn, and, you know, they were also obviously right that, again, you know, we had the feeling we, c we can change it. This is going to end. But, uh, as we know, in both cases, the politicians had their own political imperatives to keep going. And in the case of Vietnam, it was um, Kennedy and, and then Johnson, all of them, um, couldn't be seen as being soft on communists. So they had to go on with the war, no matter what. Um, and then when we had our own Blair and Brown, they had that same mixture of political and um, personal imperatives, not to be seen as being soft on a dictator. And we were all supposed to forget that they had been best friends with that dictator a very short time before. And one of my favorite things is always to re-look at that photograph of Rumsfeld um, uh, shaking hands so warmly with Saddam Hussein. It's a bit like the picture of Tony Blair with Gaddafi, which is a firm favourite on my um, computer. But anyway, in their arrogance and their ignorance, they pressed ahead with Iraq, despite the fact that the only way they could do it was by telling incredibly huge and enormous lies. And none of us will forget Colin Powell front his shaming performance in front of the UN, or indeed Tony Blair and his dossier, and the idea that in 45 minutes we could all be uh, wiped out by those non-existent weapons of mass destructions. And the, 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 the main way, I think, behind everything that Kate is talking about, about fragmentation and all of that, I think there's, there's a huge element of why we failed, is that they successfully implanted fear. And they have done nothing but continue with implanting fear. I mean, we heard Cameron in, in, in Algeria just this last week saying there's an ex existential threat because 40 terrorists have tried to take over an oil plant. We are now suddenly unsafe. And it's the old Blair game. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the, the toll of the US wars, in which, of course, Britain has been such a partner. But if you look at the countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Pakistan, Yemen, and you look at those lost lives and lost livelihoods, lost homes, exile, poverty, and everything that we are actually responsible for, it's such a horrifying to total that it's something I think it's really hard for any of us to take in. Um, and we have to ask, you know, what was it for? Well, we know what it was for. It was partly about oil, but it was mostly about imperialist domination, American domination. Um, and of course, as you all know, the tentacles of the war went and remain so much wider than those countries I've named. They went to every single continent. And I really like your title, The Reality of War Without End, because that is what um, we're looking at. And I just want to say something about some new kinds of war, which are, um, are now very much on the American agenda. And I think we have to hold them in our minds because it's different. And I've got five, five headings. Drones, obviously. 
killing from thousands of miles away, no loss of US soldiers, only profits for American companies. Then there's the use of private contractors, particularly notable in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. They do the fighting, they make the rules, and again, they make massive profits for companies like G4S, Blackwater. Thirdly, you have proxy wars, such as in Somalia and now in Mali, where you have soldiers from very poor countries being paid to fight these wars and do the dying. In Somalia, of course, you have Uganda and Rwanda. And in West Africa, you have every West African state in the most extraordinary <coughs> coalition. And fourthly, I'm just mentioning the preparations for wars. There were 170 bilateral and multilateral US military and naval exercises in Asia alone last year. That's kind of an astonishing total. And the last of my five, and less visible than the others, and in my view even more frightening, is the cyber war. And we're beginning to get, well we've had over the last little while, we've had a lot of examples of the American-Israeli attacks, uh, cyber attacks on Iran, and we get something, um, skirmishes between the US and China cyber wars. And those glimpses aren't enough, we need to know much more about it. Um, and all of this toll of destruction, the thing that I think is the most horrifying about it is there's no acknowledgement by the people responsible. Their narrative is all of this is keeping us safe and therefore we're meant to be grateful and keep quiet. And I want to when we're thinking about this overall picture, I want to flag up two symbolic areas in the world of war without end. One already mentioned by Kate is Palestine, with its incredibly rapidly deteriorating social and political future. And the second is Guantanamo Bay, where you have 177 men, the vast majority of whom were long ago cleared by the Americans of having done anything wrong, all of whom have been held for 10 years completely illegally outside any kind of international law, outside the Geneva Conventions. And the unthinkable thing is, they are very likely to be there forever. And I mention these two just because I think they don't only illustrate the horror of war without end, but I think that they illustrate something horrible that's happened in our society, which uh, Kate didn't um, go into when she talked about why are we less successful in our mobilization than before. And I think that one thing that's happened is we've become numbed, not we obviously, or we wouldn't be sitting here on a Monday evening or Tuesday evening, whatever it is. Um, but I think most people have just accepted that this world of destruction is normal and the absolute outrage which there should be every minute of everybody's life about Palestine or about Guantanamo isn't there and this this is a kind of real problem for for, for us um, and just to say two things against what I've just said I, I, I'm sure many of you were on the amazing march for Gaza after the last attack on that day when the rain was like Africa, you know, it just didn't stop. We were drenched and it was the most amazing mobilization and I felt so heartened and so kind of proud of us all that we were doing it. And then on Guantanamo, you know, there are a few stalwarts who demonstrate and go in their orange suits and never stop talking about it and, you know, good for them, I think it's brilliant. And I want to mention Islam Channel, which last week did two specials on Shaka Arma, the last person from Britain who's still there. And, you know, they said, you want one se segment or two segments? Uh, well, let's have two segments. And they, you know, it was a whole hour. And could you get five minutes on Channel 4? No, you couldn't, you know? Mm -hmm. It's... 
And I also want to um, say one other thing that I think should give us all incredible pride in the anti-war movement, that the last but one prime minister cannot appear in public mm -hmm. in this country. And any time I feel down about anything, I think about that. And it's an amazing achievement by all of us. And I think it just kind of shows us that the culture of resistance, although it's not visible in the way that it so encouragingly was, it's still there and we are very much part of it. And as Kate said, part of the sort of great time against Iraq was the idea that we were part of a worldwide movement and we still are. I think the culture of resistance is, is everywhere and it's one of our great strengths that we know that it's everywhere. Um, anyway, I won't say more about Tony Blair or that um, But I want to turn now to, very briefly, to a different aspect, both of the ten years of the war on terror and the current wars without end. Um, I used to be, a long time ago, before many of you were born, I was actually a war reporter um, in Vietnam. And uh, after that, I went on to be one in many obscure wars in Africa. And what I learnt over those years was that the only way to understand these wars for myself and also to be able to convey them was to find a small corner and really feel I understood that. So I never went to any briefings, I never saw any diplomats, kept away from generals and I think that I managed to understand those wars. And this is what I've tried to do with the war on terror. But this time I didn't go off to refugee camps and destroyed villages and besieged cities. I stayed here. <clears throat> and what I've spent the last 10 years doing, which is what my book is about, is I found a whole world here of Muslim women, some of them British, some of them from many, many different nationalities, Africans, um, Arabs, but all, a lot of different ones although there was a rather big Palestinian theme, I must admit. And all of their families had somebody, a husband or a son or a brother, who was either in Guantanamo, and in one case still is, or had been scooped up after 9-11, the people who were put in Belmarsh completely without charge and kept there for two years until the House of Lords ordered them to be released, in which we invented this Orwellian thing of control orders and kept them under house arrest in Britain. If you say to the average foreigner, you know, I've written something about people who are under house arrest in Britain, they go, what? And this was the world that I um, was, became privileged, actually, to become part of. And what I've seen of the cruelty and the racism and the Islamophobia with which these families have been treated by the authorities, not only the main ones, like the Prime Minister, but at so many levels of small fellows in the UK border agency or nurses in hospital and so on, has been completely shaming. And it fits into what I said earlier about the numbing, the lack of empathy, the lack of feeling that this has anything to do with with us. And of course, what I realized was that the whole dynamic of us, we're meant to be afraid of them. We're meant to feel that somehow being horrible to them and treating them in these grotesque ways is keeping us safe. This is part of the narrative that these governments have been one after another doing. The Labour were just as bad. In fact, in some ways, I think they were even more disgusting than the government that we have now. So, this, this was my way of understanding the war on terror. And the people that I met, because each one brought me another one, or another one, or another one. And part of my book has some, some women in America whose cases I didn't know about before, but I began to research them because 
of the people from here who were going to be extradited to America and were indeed done, taken uh, last autumn. And I think the picture that I have of the war on terror in this kind of microcosm is equally as horrifying as what has happened in the destruction of these civilizations like Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think that for all of us, um, the ability to keep aware of what's happened and to keep outraged at what's happened is, is the dynamic that will keep us in the anti-war movement and will keep us being confident that we have to fight these fights. We cannot say, it's nothing to do with me, or I'm a bit tired, or any of the reasons why people, or maybe it's too frightening for me. It's not. It's our world, and we have to claim it. So, um, I'm really pleased to have been invited, and I'm very pleased that my friend Celius is here, because and there's a huge overlap into this world that I'm talking about of almost entirely women and what is happening with the justice and security bill and the other things that this government is, is, has brought in which target the communities that my friends are on the edges of and I know that NMA is very um, involved in this kind of world as well. So 